Hello friends and welcome back to the channel. I am Dr. Mohsen Raj. I am a DM Cardiology student at Ames, New Delhi. In this video, I will discuss some of the questions, of, obviously not all, some of the questions of NEET PG 2023 and some of the lessons that you have to learn from such an exam. See, it's not about giving you the exact answer of this particular question. I'm sure there are so many videos available, available for that and they are relatively average questions. So the answer, finding answer to these questions is not difficult. But things that you can understand and learn from these questions is what I'm going to discuss and what should be your focus for the upcoming INICT exam. Okay, so let's start. So one of the questions that was given was that an ECG was shown to you and you were supposed to answer that which drug was responsible for this ECG finding. And the ECG abnormality that was given there were tall peak T waves. Go and check my previous video on ECG. Go and check the video I made for INICT or other basic ECG videos and you will find that I've already uh, explained all ECG manifestations of electrolyte abnormalities. Our previous questions kholo. Our previous exams ke questions NEET PG ke dekho, INICT ke dekho, sub mein you'll find an ECG based question and that ECG based question will either be in the form of an MI or an AV block or some form of electrolyte abnormality. Kush 6, 7, 8 ECG aapko memorize karne, that's all. So this was one of those ECGs, hyperkalemia. But, ab isme ek next level thinking chahiye thi ki that which drugs cause hyperkalemia. To, I'm not sure exactly which, what were the options there, but commonly jo clinical practice mein drugs use hote hain that cause hyperkalemia are ACE inhibitors, ARBs, that's angiotensin receptor blockers, or ARNEs, the scubitral valsartan, which is being commonly used these days, and mandolocorticoid antagonists, which is spironolactone. So these are the common drugs that can cause hyperkalemia. So whichever was the option there in, in the question, out of these four, that is the correct answer. So the trick was to identify hyperkalemia and then to know the drug which causes hyperkalemia. So please understand ECG abnormalities in electrolyte disturbances are very important questions. Please read them. Okay. This was one of the slides from my previous videos findings in hypokalemia where you have ST depression, where you have, you know, a flattening of T waves and then appearance of U waves and the findings in hyperkalemia. There is tall peak T waves, disappearance of P waves, then widening of QRS complex, and there are separate videos for, that explain this. So, and this is otherwise clinically important as well. Why are these questions so commonly asked in entrance exams? Because you should be able to recognize tall peak T waves in a patient and think that this patient may have hyperkalemia. Because if you do so, this is life saving. This is life saving. If you can save somebody's life, if you institute treatment of hyperkalemia by recognizing these ECG abnormalities. So no matter whether you're a surgeon or you're whatever doctor you are, you should have these basic ECG skills. Okay. The other question was uh, a mid diastolic murmur in a patient who has a prominent A wave in JVP. So this is a fact that you have to know that which murmurs are mid-diastolic murmurs, which heart valve lesions cause mid-diastolic murmurs, and which particular lesion is associated with a prominent A wave in JVP. So again, a two-step thinking process, right? They are not one-step questions, they're two-step questions. So what are the mid-diastolic murmurs you know of? Now, there are many causes, but two most important causes that you should know are mitral stenosis and tricuspid stenosis. Mitral stenosis, tricuspid stenosis are important causes of mid-diastolic murmur. Now, which out of the two is more likely to be associated with a prominent A wave in JVP? So you know that A wave of the JVP is caused by atrial contraction, atrial systole, which means any obstruction to, to the output from the atrium in the form of tricuspid stenosis, that's the obstruction from right atrium to right ventricle can cause prominent A wave. Well, prominent A wave can also occur if there is right ventricular hypertrophy, if the right ventricle is pressure overloaded, say because of pulmonary hypertension or because of pulmonary stenosis, that's right. But out of the two, mitral stenosis and tricuspid stenosis, 
it is tricuspid stenosis that is obstruction between right atrium and right ventricle which is more likely to be associated with a prominent AV. So the answer of this question is tricuspid stenosis. So what do you what do you get from this question? You should know the different causes of murmurs. What are the causes of ejection systolic murmur? What are the causes of pansystolic murmur? What are the causes of early diastolic murmur? Why? Because you can have a similar question in the upcoming I and ICT. Or you can have the similar question in next exam. These are clinical pearls that you learn from clinical postings. Well, this is what you're supposed to learn when you go to general medicine ward in your third year MBBS or fourth year MBBS, right? So the common causes of mid-diastolic murmur besides mitral stenosis and tricuspid stenosis would be atrial myxoma. A tumor in the right atrium, a tumor in the left atrium will behave like mitral stenosis and tricuspid stenosis. And sometimes you have a severe aortic regurgitation. When the jet of the aortic regurgitation strikes the mitral leaflets, that produces a mid-diastolic murmur, which is known as Austin Flint murmur. This murmur is important because if you find this murmur, it means that this patient's aortic regurgitation is severe and this patient needs the replacement of the aortic valve. Okay, but whatever the situation is, you need to know the different causes of mid diastolic murmur. You should also be aware about the different waveforms of JVP the A wave that's caused by atrial contraction, the X descent that's the atrial relaxation, C, which is because of tricuspid valve closure and protrusion into the right atrium with ventricular systole, V is the passive filling of the atria when the ventricle is contracting, right? So A is because of atrial contraction, V is during ventricular contraction when the atria are passively filling, right? Okay, and you should also know common JVP abnormalities like absent A waves in atrial fibrillation. This can be asked in I and ICT. A JVP absent A waves, where do you find absent A waves? Atrial fibrillation, large A waves in tricuspid stenosis, pulmonary stenosis, pulmonary hypertension, cannon A waves in AV dissociation. It's a potential question in the next exam. Canon A waves, large V waves of tricuspid regurgitation. This is the potential question in the coming exams. Okay, so the exams are going little bit more clinical, little bit more integration or little bit of two-step thought process. It's not a straight one-to-one -one answer, but you need to think, yes, Mitral stenosis, tricuspid stenosis, both can cause mid-diastolic murmur. But tricuspid stenosis is more likely to be associated with a prominent A wave in JVP. And therefore, the answer of this question is tricuspid stenosis. You should be able to recognize common JVP abnormalities. For example, this prominent A wave of tricuspid stenosis or the stall V wave in tricuspid regurgitation. Okay. Now, this is another question that uh, that was there in the NEET PG uh, 2023. They had shown you some murmur and then you had to answer that this murmur is because of aortic stenosis. They had given you a picture, something like this. S1, S2, the two heart sounds, and then a, a murmur which is sort of diamond-shaped, ejection systolic murmur, or what is known as crescendo, decrescendo murmur. This is an example of aortic stenosis. You had to choose aortic stenosis. So this is again a skill that you learn in your clinical postings. So you should know what is a pansystolic murmur. Starts with S1, is throughout systole and covers S2. This is pansystolic. This, these two on the other hand are ejection systolic murmurs. There's a clear gap between S1 and the onset of murmur and there's a clear gap between the end of the murmur and the S2. These are ejection systolic murmurs, something you get in aortic stenosis or pulmonic stenosis. Okay. Then something like an early diastolic murmur, right? This is S1, this is S2. The period between S1 and S2 is systole. And the period after S2 is diastole. So this is early diastolic murmur, which you find in aortic regurgitation. This is the murmur of aortic stenosis out here. There's an opening snap and then a mid-diastolic murmur. So what I mean is that you should recognize these graphic presentations of different murmurs. And you should be able to auscultate them in your patients because you're doctors. You should be able to tell that a patient has a pansystolic murmur at the left lower sternal border due to a ventricular septal defect. You're an MBBS graduate for that matter. And the last example shown here is that of a continuous murmur. This continuous murmur starts in systole and continues for a variable duration in diastole. Okay, so this is a representation of mitral stenosis murmur. This is S2, so the end of systole.
and the then the start of diastole so the period between s2 and s1 is diastole you have an opening snap then a mid diastolic rumbling murmur followed by pre systolic accentuation go and read hutchinson for example go and read any clinical examination book go and read about the descriptions of the common murmurs read how they describe aortic regurgitation murmur they will say it's a blowing murmur which is early diastolic a decrescendo murmur know these terms go and examine patients in your wards you will remember them for the life okay so an ejection systolic murmur of aortic stenosis a pan systolic murmur of mitral regurgitation or a pan systolic murmur of tricuspid regurgitation or for that matter ventricular septal defect so what i mean is that if you are attentive in your clinical postings in a third year in your fourth year you quite these questions will be very easy questions and remember these questions have been there in the previous exams in the pp by qs so even if you read and revise previous year questions i'm sure you will get most of these questions right another question which was there in the exam see these are sort of one liners in a sense but they they just put they they just put forward in your exam questions in a different fashion everybody knows about pan cost tumor but they told you that there's a patient who has an arm pain and has ptosis and they have given you some x-ray which has right upper lobe mass so this is this should come to your mind that there's a tumor in the apex of the lung which is irritating the nerve c8 t1 which is causing ptosis which is causing pain in a shoulder this is pan cost tumor a one liner but this is a perfect example how you can convert a one liner question into a clinical vignette another one liner question by the way vitamin deficiencies are big time important so know about all vitamin deficiencies for this neat pgri and ict exam subacute combined degeneration of spinal cord is due to which vitamin deficiency a one liner straightforward b12 deficiency so how do you read for the exam go to any standard book or for that matter even the review books will have tables that mention all the vitamins their classic deficiency signs i've just taken just 2 minutes ago i just took a photograph of a book that mentions b12 deficiency there was a picture given for this this is that lemon colored skin which is because of pallor of anemia and jaundice tinge of jaundice yellowish tinge because of ineffective erythropoiesis that occurs in megaloblastic anemia this is that shiny atrophic tongue which is painful as well that these patients have this is subacute combined degeneration of spinal cord and this is another potential question in your exam this has been there in INICT this hypersegmented neutrophil or b12 deficiency so you should know vitamin deficiencies inside out right left whatever know everything about vitamin deficiencies because they're commonly asked questions and it doesn't take you an app to tell you to read this question यार इतनी बार आ चुके हैं वाइटामिन डिफिशियंसीज क्वेश्चन यू शुड बी थॉरो विद दीज क्वेश्चन राइट सो जस्ट फ्यू पर्ल्स ऑन वाइटामिन बी टूवेल डिफिशियंसी आई एव शोन यू द पिक्चर ऑफ ग्लोसाइटिस वेर यू हैव स्मूथ सोर टंग विद एट्रोफिया पैपले शाइनी टंग देर आर डिफरेंट न्यूरोलॉजिकल मैनिफेस्टेशन ऑफ बी टूवेल डिफिशियंसी neurological diseases because of demyelination and you should even know why demyelination occurs what's wrong with myelin so there's something that there's deficiency of methyl b12 which is required for conversion of homocysteine to methionine and methionine somehow somewhere is required in formation of myelin at least this basic thing tomorrow the same question can appear in inict remember whenever you have macrocytic anemia and you have neurological disease think of b12 deficiency okay the different clinical manifestations uh, of uh, spinal cord involvement are known as subacute combined degeneration where you have involvement of posterior column involvement of lateral corticospinal tract dorsal spinocerebellar tract these in turn lead to posterior column involvement causes loss of vibratory sensation and proprioception involvement of lateral corticospinal tract causes spasticity involvement of spinocerebellar tract causes ataxia and these patients can also have dementia okay so what i mean is that these exams are going towards more of clinical correlates whenever you read think in terms of patients R recall a patient of subacute combined degeneration of spinal cord if you have seen them in your medicine postings or imagine a clinical vignette put 
together things. Yes, this is anemia, blood picture, hypersegmented neutrophil. This is spinal cord involvement and sometimes dementia, the brain involvement. So get used to clinical correlates. Another question, a pure recall question, a previous year question, jaw mass was shown in an African child. They, they want you to know the particular chromosome translocation. Well, this is as classic as it can be. An African child with a jaw mass, a, a peripheral blood picture can be given to you or the biopsy sample can be given to you, which shows starry sky appearance. This is Burkitt lymphoma. Any standard textbook, even any standard review book or every coaching material will show you these common tables where they have different non-Hodgkin lymphomas, knowing, telling you that Burkitt is an important non-Hodgkin lymphoma in children telling you the relationship with Epstein-Barr virus, telling you the starry sky appearance where the, ne ne the neoplastic B cells form the dark of the night and reactive histocytes form the stars, the debris. I'm sh I'll show you another picture. So these are the lymphocytes. These are the lymphoid blasts. And these areas, these stars are actually histiocytes. They are foamy macrophages. This is starry sky appearance of Burkitt lymphoma. And you have to memorize that this is translocation 814. They frequently ask these translocations. And you have to memorize them the day before the exam, 48 hours before the exam, such topics which are so frequently ex asked in the, in the exam. So now, I'm not going to discuss, obviously, all the questions. There are videos available easily on the net. And plus, these are previous year questions. Mostly, 70% of the questions asked in any exam like NEET PG are somewhere from pre previous year questions, from the exact repeats to questions from similar topics. So what, what's my message to you is that INICT is coming. No matter whether you perform bad in NEET PG or even if you performed excellent in NEET PG, I want you to first take a break, maybe for a week, get relaxed, spend time with your family, spend time with your friends, go enjoy, um, you know, make a trip, whatever. Get yourself ready after one week. No matter what the results of this exam are, start preparing for INICT. And how do you prepare for INICT from now onwards? Well, you've read most of the syllabus. You've read your 19 subjects. I want you to remember previous year questions. Pichli 10 saal ke questions kholo. Un questions ke options memorize karlo. The exact answer, remember the exact answer. Or uske surrounding wale areas, jo aapke review books mein diye huye. Koi bhi aims previous 10 year question paper ki book le lo. Usme jo explanations hai, remember those explanations. I'm sure you will get a good rank in INICT. And is it worth it? Agar aapka paper achcha hua in PG mein, is it worth ki aap abhi aur ek mahina padho, May mein exam hai, first week mein? Is it worth it that you spoil your one month and read and read and read these previous equations and appear in INICT? Yes, it's worth it. Yet AIMS New Delhi mein MD karna is a different game. So you have this opportunity. I had it. I had the opportunity at my time. Meri bhi NEET PG mein awesome rank thi, but I didn't care about it. I read about AIMS PGI, I read about PGI Chandigarh. So the point is, aapka exam kaisa bhi hua ho, ganda hua to, all the more reasons you should read more, achha bhi hua ho, tab bhi prepare karo, INICT exam do, aim for AIMS, aim for PGI, okay? So thank you and good luck.